Welcome to the Dollar Debauchery Program, brought to you by Cliff Cool's Notes, a daily consolidator on the most insightful presentations, articles, essays, and the interviews on the web on the ultimate confidence game, money. Our site presents ideas from the smartest and wisest money managers, economists, and analysts. Welcome to the Dollar Debauchery. My name is Allison Holditch. Today I'm going to be speaking with Richard Duncan. Richard is an author and economist. He has uh, written three books, The Dollar Crisis, The New Depression, and The Correction of Capitalism. Uh, Richard has worked as an equity analyst. He's been the head of investments uh, strategies for an asset management company and a financial sector specialist for the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Richard, thank you very much for joining me this morning. Good morning. Thank you. Richard, can you refresh your theory of creditism uh, to our viewers? I believe that the nature of our economic system fundamentally changed in 1968 when the United States stopped backing dollars with gold. At that point, we moved from a a pure commodity-backed monetary system to a fiat monetary system, and that fundamentally changed everything. The most significant change is that once we broke the link between dollars and gold, it removed all the constraints on how much credit could be created. And afterwards, credit absolutely exploded. And what I mean by credit is all the credit and debt are two sides of the same coin. So when I talk about total credit or total debt, I mean government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, financial sector debt, all the debt. So once we moved, removed the link between dollars and gold, total credit exploded. It grew from $1 trillion in 1964 to $50 trillion in 2007. So in just 43 years, it increased 50 times, from $1 trillion to $50 trillion. And this explosion of credit, it really created our world. It made us all much more prosperous materially than we would have been otherwise. The problem is is that after growing so long and so rapidly, it now seems very uncertain whether credit can continue expanding because the private sector in the U.S. is incapable of bearing any more debt. And there's a real danger that if credit now begins to contract after a a four and a half decade, $50 trillion expansion, that we would have an equally protracted downward spiral that would lead to a new Great Depression. So in the past, under capitalism, capitalism created economic growth like this. Businessmen would invest. Some of them would make a profit. They would save that profit, or in other words, accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat the process. The growth dynamic was driven by investment, and savings. And that's how capitalism created economic growth. But that's not the way our system now has worked for decades. Under this new system, which I call creditism, the growth dynamic works like this. Instead of being driven by investment and savings, it's driven by credit creation and consumption, and more credit creation and more consumption. And that's created very rapid economic growth. In fact, much more rapid growth than would have occurred under capitalism. Again, the problem, however, is that it now looks like creditism can't continue to expand because the private sector can't bear any more debt. So uh, in my opinion, we've moved from capitalism to creditism. Is creditism breaking down? And if so, how and and at what rate? And, And what would really be the effect of this breakdown on the global economy and the financial markets? Okay, well, so in 2008, when the private sector started defaulting on its debt, Creditism, creditism started to break down and came very close to collapsing into a new Great Depression. It was only very aggressive government intervention that prevented that from happening. So when the private sector, the households, when they started defaulting and, and reducing their level of debt, had the government not jumped in with trillion dollar budget deficits. In other words, the, the, at one point the government was budget deficit was $1.4 trillion. And over the last five years, it's exceeded $6 trillion. 
So the government has borrowed another $6 trillion since this crisis started. And it's been government debt that's kept total credit expanding. Otherwise, credit would have peaked and started spiraling down. And all of the good things that were occurring while credit was, was expanding, they would have gone into reverse. So while credit was expanding rapidly, then the consumers had more money to spend, so they spent more. So businesses became more profitable. So they hired more people, they expanded their capacity, maybe they built a new corporate headquarters, and they even paid more taxes, so the government had more money to spend. And all the while, asset prices were inflating upward in an ever-increasing upward spiral, creating yet more collateral for the consumers to borrow against. But in 2008, that all started to go into reverse. And had the government not jumped in by borrowing another $6 trillion, then creditism would have collapsed into a new Great Depression. And so not only was it very aggressive fiscal stimulus, but in addition to that, the Fed has introduced quantitative easing. And since the crisis started, the Fed has created $3 trillion new fiat dollars which they've used to help finance this expansion of U.S. government debt. So had the government not responded so aggressively, then creditism would have collapsed and we would have now, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would be reliving the, the worst horrors of the 1930s and probably the 1940s as well. It would have been a new Great Depression. Globalization would have collapsed and the stock market would have crashed, unemployment would have skyrocketed. Uh, think back to what occurred in the 1930s, and that's what we would be living through now. And there's still a danger that that could occur. Can you f clarify the historical basis of the link between the explosion in credit and debt and the time when the U.S. dollar was taken off the gold standard? Yes, so after World War II, the United States ha had most of the world's gold. So there was, no, there was no difficulty for the Fed to maintain gold backing for the dollar. There was a law that required the Fed to maintain at least 25% gold backing for, for the dollar. And that was no problem up until the 1960s. And by that point, by that point, because of several factors, the U.S. started losing a great deal of gold during the 1960s. Under the Bretton Woods system, other countries had the right to convert the dollars that they owned into U.S. gold. That was the foundation of the Bretton Woods International Monetary System. And that was fine until the 1960s. But in the 1960s, because President Johnson was really spending too much money both on the Vietnam War abroad and on domestic social welfare programs at home in the United States. This overstimulated the U.S. economy and resulted in more imports coming into the U.S. So the U.S. started running a trade deficit and that threw dollars overseas that were accumulated by other countries' governments. At the same time, the U.S corporations were also investing a great deal of money overseas, particularly in Europe, and that was sending money, dollars, overseas to other countries. So as these countries accumulated dollars during the 1960s, they started converting them into U.S. gold. So during the 1960s, the U.S. actually lost half of its gold reserves, 250 million ounces of gold. And so eventually, the U.S. no longer had enough gold to allow other countries to continue converting their dollars into U.S. gold. And furthermore, they no longer had enough gold left to allow the Fed to continue backing the dollar with gold. And so finally, in 1968, President Johnson asked Congress to remove the, the requirement for the Fed to maintain any gold backing. And they did, Congress passed that law. So afterwards, there was no longer any gold backing for the dollar. And three years later, President Nixon told the world that he would no longer allow foreign countries to convert their dollars into U.S. gold. 
he's closing the, the so-called gold window. And that was the end of the Bretton Woods system. So that's the historical background. And again, once the link between dollars and gold was broken, everything changed. It removed all the constraints on how much credit could be created. Credit exploded. And also, and very importantly, what we saw is that for the first time, trade between countries ceased to balance. Under the gold standard, or a quasi-gold standard Bretton Woods system, international trade had to balance. It, simply because if one country had a trade deficit with another country, it had to pay for the deficit with gold. And given that each country only had so much gold, they could only run a trade deficit for a few years before they ran out of gold. And that would have been catastrophic for their economy. So under a, under a gold standard, there was an automatic adjustment mechanism that made sure that trade between countries balanced. And when the Bretton Woods system broke down, and when the US stopped backing dollars with gold in the late 60s, early 70s, then, after that, the U.S. started running extraordinarily large trade and current account deficits with the rest of the world. And it found that it didn't have to pay for those deficits with gold. It could simply pay for them with dollars or treasury bonds denominated in paper dollars. And there was no limit as to how many of those the U.S. could create. So the United States started running larger and larger trade deficits with countries like Japan. And those countries received more and more dollars in exchange. And as those dollars went into the Japanese banking system, they caused rapid deposit growth, and that led to rapid loan growth, and that led to very rapid economic growth. And quite soon, Japan turned into an economic bubble. And by the late 1980s, there was so much asset price inflation in Japan as a result of its trade surplus with the United States that they say that the gardens around the Imperial Palace in Tokyo were more valuable than California. And then in, in 89 and 90, that bubble popped. And it, Japan's economy has been in, in crisis now for coming up to 24 years. And what we've seen is that one country after another, the countries that have all had large trade surpluses with the United States, They've all blown into bubbles, and those bubbles have popped. So the next round was after Japan came the Asia crisis countries, Thailand, where I live, and Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Korea. They were all blown into bubbles in the 1990s, and those bubbles popped. And more recently, China has been blown into a great economic bubble for the same reason. They have a massive trade surplus with the US that results in dollars entering the Chinese economy they go into the banking system, they cause rapid deposit growth, that forces rapid loan growth, and the rapid loan growth creates very rapid economic growth. And so in that way, China's economy has been blown into a great bubble. It just hasn't popped yet. So these trade imbalances that occurred after the break between dollars and gold, these trade imbalances have destabilized the global economy and created a giant global economic bubble that is in grave danger of collapsing. Richard, can you relate where we are now in terms of the credit growth and the trend in liquidity for this year and for the next two to three years in your forecasts? Okay, so in terms of credit growth, it looks to me that credit growth is going to remain below 2% for the next several years. There are only five big sectors of the U.S. economy in terms of their in terms of the significance of their debt levels. The U.S. government, the household sector, the corporate sector, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the private sector issuers of asset-backed securities. So one of these sectors has to expand their level of debt very significantly for us to get above 2% credit growth. For instance, total credit in the United States now is $58 trillion. So if we assume that there's a 2% inflation rate, then in order for this to grow by 2% after inflation on a base of 58 trillion, that means that total credit has to grow by something like $2.3 trillion this year just to hit that 2% credit growth threshold that keeps us from being in recession. 
So who's going to borrow $2.3 trillion in 2014? The US government budget deficit is coming down very sharply. In 2012, the budget deficit was $1.1 trillion. That means the government borrowed $1.1 trillion in 2012. But in 2013, the budget deficit came down to less than $700 billion. And in 2014, they're going to, it's going to be less than $600 billion. So the government's going to borrow $600 billion. Who's going to borrow the other $1.7 trillion? Well, as far as I can see, no one is. So credit growth is going to be, it's going to remain weak. The household sector borrowing is not going to increase that significantly. Fannie and Freddie's borrowing won't. The corporate sector won't. So we just don't get to the 2% credit growth that we need to keep us out of recession. Now, in terms of liquidity, this is really the thing that is most important for investors because it's liquidity now that drives the direction of asset prices. So what do I mean by liquidity? Let me give you, I have something I call a liquidity gauge that shows when liquidity is excessive or when there is a liquidity drain. I'll give you a simplified version of it. Last year, the Fed created $1 trillion of fiat money. So it injected $1 trillion of liquidity into the economy. The, the government, on the other hand, their budget deficit was roughly $700 billion. So the Fed created $1 trillion, and the government absorbed $700 billion. That left excess liquidity of $300 billion. So in other words, the, the Fed created more than enough fiat money to finance the government's entire budget deficit last year. And there was another $300 billion of excess liquidity on top of that. And by the way, that's just one of the sources of liquidity. There's another source that I, I won't go into now. It's a bit technical. But that excess liquidity last year is the reason that the stock market went up 30% and why home prices went up 13%. And that's where we got the surge in household sector net worth and the wealth effect that drove the economy last year. All right, so looking ahead into 2014, we're going to continue to have excess liquidity in the first quarter and in the second quarter. That's, in fact, we're going to have more excess liquidity in the second quarter than in the first. And the reason for that is because Americans pay taxes in April. So the government doesn't have to borrow any money generally in the second quarter. But meanwhile, the Fed will still be creating fiat money every month and pumping that liquidity into the economy. So in the first half of this year, there's going to continue to be excess liquidity. And that's going to continue to support asset prices. In fact, there's a, a risk that this excess liquidity will drive the stock market considerably higher in the second quarter. But the change comes in the third quarter. In the third quarter, the government will borrow more money than the Fed plans to create. And in the fourth quarter, the Fed's going to stop creating money altogether. And so there'll be a very significant liquidity drain in the fourth quarter. And if the Fed sticks with its current taper schedule that it has announced in terms of the timing of its reduction in fiat money creation, then what we're going to see is beginning in the third quarter, if, if not sooner, interest rates are going to start going up. The stock market's going to start going down hard. Property prices are going to fall. Net worth is going to start contracting. Consumption will drop and the U.S. will be back in recession by the end of the year. And so for that reason, I don't think the Fed is going to stick with its current taper schedule. I think that at some point in the third quarter, they're going to have to tell the world that we're going to continue with quantitative easing for longer than we've suggested thus far. And at that point, then there'll be a very significant rebound in all the asset classes. So it's going to be a treacherous few months in which we may see quite a boom in asset prices in the second quarter given the ongoing very high levels of excess liquidity. But that switches quite quickly to a shortage of liquidity in the third quarter that will be hard on asset prices resulting in a correction. But at some point afterwards, the Fed will have to reverse its plans to taper 
and the market's likely to rebound again. So I think what we have, investors should keep in mind that this isn't capitalism. This isn't an economy driven by market forces. The government is directing the economy. And the way they're directing it now is the Fed is pushing up asset prices. And that's making the economy grow by creating a wealth effect and consumption. And the Fed has to continue doing this or else we're going to go back into recession. And the Fed is aware of this. So their challenge is to create enough liquidity to make asset prices keep going up, but not so much liquidity that it results in an incredible stock market bubble that pops in the near term. So I think they will be able to manage this. And I would look for the S&P index, for example, to probably be somewhere around 2100 by the end of 2015. So that's another 15% upwards or so, which is quite, quite reasonable. And that by pushing up the stock market, that's the way the Fed will ensure that the economy keeps growing. But there, there's going to be a lot of volatility between now and then, in my opinion. What are your thoughts on the Federal Reserve policy? Do you see the policy as distorting market prices? And if so, how? Uh, do you see unintended consequences to Fed policy? And if so, where is it being manifested? OK, well, what everyone needs to understand is that, again, we no longer have a capitalist economy. Let's, let's think about this. Under capitalism, the government played very little role. Well, now in the United States, really, in fact, going back to World War II, the United States government has spent somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of GDP every year for 70 years. So fiscal stimulus and government spending has, is the dominant factor within the economy, 20 to 5 20 to 25 percent of GDP. So that's not capitalism. And on, on top of that, under capitalism, gold was money, and the Fed had nothing to do with it. The government had nothing to do with it. But now the Fed creates the money from thin air and uses it to manipulate interest rates and asset prices to ensure that the economy grows. So, so when we think about whether the Fed is having a distorting impact on the economy, well, yes, the, econ the entire economy is being driven by the Fed and by U.S. government fiscal, fiscal policy, a combination of fiscal policy and monetary policy. So the government is directing the economy. We have, uh, you could call it, government-directed creditism. And in terms of is it distorting the economy, well, yes, this has created incredible distortions because we have this now this fiat-based monetary system that's allowed credit to expand from $1 trillion in 1964 to $58 trillion now. This has completely warped everything. It has created our world. So our world is a product of government intervention at the fiscal and at the monetary level. And without a continuation of this intervention, our world deflates and collapses into a new Great Depression. In fact, it would be so severe that it's not at all certain that our civilization would survive that. So it's useful, I think, to think of the global economy as being a big rubber raft. But instead of being inflated with air, this rubber raft has been inflated with credit. Now the problem is, and on top of the raft, we have all the asset classes, stocks, property, bonds, commodities, including gold, and 7 billion people, the world's population. The, the problem is, is the raft, is the global economy, is now defective. There are holes all around the sides of the raft, and the, the credit keeps leaking out the sides. And the natural tendency of the raft is to sink. And when it sinks, stocks go down, and bonds go down, and property goes down, commodities go down, and gold goes down, and the 7 billion people start to go underwater. Their feet get wet. And there's only one possible policy response at, that, at this point, and that's for the governments to pump in more credit. And that's what quantitative easing is about. That's why the Fed is pumping in fiat money. That's why the Bank of Japan is doing the same thing. The European Union, the Bank of England, all the governments are pumping in more credit to reflate the global economy. And when they do that, the raft then rises again, 
and stocks go up and bonds go up and property goes up, commodities go up, and the people are once again happy. Everyone's happy. But if they stop with the quantitative easing, then the raft will start sinking again. And so the reason that this global economy, this raft, the reason it's fundamentally defective is that so much credit has been created around the world that the income of the seven billion people is insufficient to service the interest on so much debt. And so they keep defaulting, whether it's the subprime defaults in the United States, the Japanese property company defaults in Japan, Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Spain, or soon to be a massive credit defaults across China. The income of the people around the planet is simply not high enough to service the interest on so much debt. And so we're now in a situation where we are on government life support. Without the intervention by the Fed and the other central banks to keep pumping in more credit into the global economy, then our global raft will sink. And that would mean not only will the asset prices crash, but literally people will die the way they did during the 1930s and 40s. And so this is the only possible policy response at this time, or at least the only one that our policymakers seem to be able to conceive of. And so this is going to carry on into the future for the foreseeable future. They will, you know, people should not be, you know, we've already had two rounds of quantitative easing. The first round started and stocks went up. And when the first round ended, stocks went down. And then the economy went into a soft patch. And then the next round of quantitative easing, QE2 started and stocks went up. And then when QE2 ended, stocks went down and the economy went into a soft patch. Then QE3 started and stocks went up and up and up. And that's where we are now. I don't see why people should be so surprised at the idea that when QE3 ends, stocks are going to go down again, the economy is going to weaken, and there'll be QE4 if it actually goes that far. I don't think that the Fed is actually going to be able to end quantitative easing this third round. I think they're just going to continue it on into the next several years because without that, our global economy would, would sink. And, and that's something that they can prevent and something that they're determined to prevent. And so I think they will prevent it. And this, this sort of scenario where we have government life support keeping the economy afloat, this is something that can go on, I believe, with very little difficulty for at least the next five years and probably even 10 years. The problem is, is that it probably cannot go on forever. And there's a real danger that at some point, say 10 to 15 years out, even the US government will be too heavily indebted to continue reflating the US and the global economy again and again. So I don't think that the danger is in the, in the next few years, but I think the real danger is somewhere roughly 10 years out. I mean, for, for instance, now the US government debt is roughly 100% of US GDP. Well, that's a high number, but look at Japan. Japan's government debt is almost 250% of Japan's GDP. Japan has been in crisis nearly 24 years. And year after year, they've had very large budget deficits. And that's kept the economy afloat. It's prevented the Japanese economy from collapsing into a depression. So the US only has 100% government debt to GDP. Our economy is $17 trillion in size. It, that suggests that the government could borrow and spend another $17 trillion before we even hit 200% government debt to GDP. And that's assuming that the economy doesn't grow at all. And of course, if the economy, if the government borrows and spends $17 trillion, the economy is going to have an extraordinarily massive boom. So in other words, this can go on for quite some time. It's, it's unfortunate that we're in this position where we must rely on the government to keep us from collapsing into a depression. It's a bit embarrassing for the United States to have to confront the reality that it doesn't have a capitalist economy, that it is a government-directed economic system 
but that's the reality. And while it's a bit embarrassing, it's better to endure a bit of embarrassment than collapse into a new Great Depression with all the horrors that that could entail. Richard, finally, what recommendations do you have from an economics advisory perspective to the global economy in terms of structural changes necessary to be implemented uh, around the world? Will these changes require monetary stimulus or fiscal stimulus or simply private investment? Here's what I think. You know, once we understand that the nature of our economic system has changed, once we understand that this isn't capitalism, like it, hate it, regret it, whatever, get over it, this isn't capitalism. Our system is directed by the government. The government spends more than 20% of GDP. It stimulates the economy that way. Wherever it spends money, that results in economic growth and corporate profits and jobs. And this is being financed by fiat money creation by the Fed. Now, the reason that this is possible for the Fed to create so much fiat money, in the past, anything like this would not have been possible because so much fiat money creation would have very quickly led to hyperinflation. Anytime central banks in the past tried to grow the economy by printing money, it very quickly led to very high rates of inflation and to crisis. The reason that's not happening this time is because something completely separate is going on, and that's globalization. And globalization is extremely deflationary because it's driving down wages in the West. You no longer have to hire someone in Michigan to build an automobile and pay that person $200 a day. You can hire someone in China to build an automobile and pay him or her $10 a day. So this represents more than a 90% drop in the cost of labor. The cost of your next worker is going to fall by 90%. And nothing like this has ever occurred before. This is extremely deflationary. And the deflationary pressures from globalization are completely offsetting the inflationary pressures coming about through this credit creation and fiat money creation. So this has created a, a unique moment in history where it's possible for our governments to borrow and spend trillions of dollars and to finance it when necessary through trillions of dollars of fiat money creation without creating uh, hyperinflation. Nothing like this has ever occurred before. So on the one hand, we are dependent on this government intervention to keep us from collapsing into a new depression. And so there are grave dangers that we now confront if creditism collapses. But at the same time, there are truly unprecedented opportunities that w exist within this new economic system. If it's indeed true, and at least it has been true for the last few years, that our government can borrow and spend trillions of dollars, and the Fed can finance that with fiat money creation without creating hyperinflation, then our policymakers really have a a unique opportunity for the government to borrow and in, invest in transformative new industries and technologies. So in other words, it seems to me that we have not just a once in a lifetime opportunity, but truly a once in history opportunity where it's possible for the governments to borrow and invest on a massive scale. And what I'm talking about is changing the way the government spends money. Rather than spending so much money on excessive consumption and war, as the US government has been doing, particularly over the last decade, I would like to see the government borrow and invest in transformative new technologies and industries. Over the next 10 years, I'd like to see the US government invest, for instance, a trillion dollars in solar energy, a trillion dollars in genetic engineering, a trillion dollars in biotech, a trillion dollars in nanotech. And if they did that, that would not only keep our global economy from collapsing into depression, it would result, it would induce a new technological revolution. In fact, it would lock in another American century. 
it would give the United States an absolutely unassailable lead in 21st industries and technologies. And beyond that, it would improve the well-being of everyone on this planet. It would create technological miracles and medical marvels uh, that everyone would benefit from. That's the opportunity that exists within our new economic system, creditism. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that our policymakers grasp the op this, this historic opportunity. But it's, it's quite fascinating. What we've seen now is that the government has run extremely large budget deficits, and they have financed this with fiat money creation, and we have no inflation. In fact, deflation seems to be a greater risk than inflation. So it's not such a great logical leap to understand that if we have this power, and in fact if we are dependent on this government spending to keep us from collapsing in depression, then let's take advantage of it. If we must spend at the government level, then let's spend on investment instead of in spending on new wars. The stimulus will be the same, but the outcome will be radically different. It will be a technological revolution that will take us into the future and improve everyone's lives. So those are the sorts of restructurings that are possible and, and that I would like to see rather than just a continuation of the wasteful government spending, which is probably what we're going to see instead. Richard, thank you very much for the interesting insights. Thank you. My pleasure.